all today. Is everybody happy? Yes. Well, you didn't dance much. <laughs> okay, you've got to do better as we go on through the day, right? Um, let me ask again, who's been to ASAP before? Mariana just asked you that question, but let me ask you again, who's been to ASAP before? Put your hands up. It's always great to see some familiar faces, people who've been to this event before, because that means we're doing something right. Is that correct? Yes. Fantastic. And I also love to see some new faces, and I know that I'm going to see you again. That's how confident I am that you will have a great day today and that you will learn a lot, and that you will also have a lot of fun. Is that exciting? Yes. Fantastic. So yes, in my session today, I want to share with you the story um, of how I was a secretary, and I became a CEO, which really, when I was a secretary, that was in my wildest dreams, really, it was. Um, so, you know what? I looked up, I know the title I've given it is from super admin to superhero. But I'm not a superhero. Are you a superhero? Is anyone in this room a superhero? Well, I looked up the definition. Uh, but first of all, I do have a superhero friend who's with me here today. This is me as my superhero alter ego. And I looked up the definition of a superhero, and here is what it said. A superhero is a fictional hero with extraordinary or superhuman powers. Does anybody in this room have superhuman powers? No, no. excellent. It also said in Merriam-Webster, it also said a superhero is an exceptionally skillful or successful person. Put your hand up if you are a skillful or successful person. Put your hand up. If you are skillful, put your hand up. Every single person in this room, put your hand up right now. <laughs> put your hand up right now. Take your elbow off the table. That's way too lazy. You are all a skillful person. Am I right? Yes. Did I tell you to put your hands down? You are all a successful person. Am I correct? Yeah. Turn to your neighbor, give her a high five, and say, you are a superhero. <laughs> so you don't need to look at your notes right now. And I think it's a little bit more important to pay attention to what's going on in the room right now. So you don't really need to look at your notes. You've got them for reference later. So I want to talk a little bit about this word successful. The word successful, a superhero, is a successful person. So it made me start thinking about this word success. What is success? And I did a Google search. Don't we love Google? Yep. I did a Google search for successful men and women. And it came up with lots of faces. Here are some of the faces. Can you, note, can you tell me who some of these people are? Shout them out. Oprah, Oprah Winfrey. Bill Gates. Steve Jobs. Bill Gates. Steve, whatever his name is, the Facebook guy, right? And what's the guy at the bottom right? The Virgin guy, what's his name? Richard Branson. And who's this lovely couple on the left? Does he look like my mum and dad? It's my mum and dad. My mum and dad were very successful people. They had me. <laughs> them so I was extremely successful at that moment I had them for parents so what is success and again it made me stop and think what is success and what is success built on so if I was to ask you that question and I am going to ask you that question what is success built on how did all those people get to be so successful? What did they have or what did they do that made them so successful? 
What do you think success is built on? Who wants to shout out a word for me? What do you think success is built on? Anybody? Hard work, thank you. Any more? Dreams. Commitment, dreams. Confidence. Confidence. Drugs. drugs. Who said drugs? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Trust. Trust. <laughs> Over here. Character. What else? Perseverance. What else? Sacrifices. Sacrifices. Aspirations. Belief. Any more? Determination. Determination. More? That's a long sentence there, <laughs> Alicia, Maxine. Being at the right place at the right time. All right. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Because I'm very interested to know what you think success is built on. Um, I've done some thinking about this myself, obviously. Um, and I remember... A few years ago, it was 2011, one of these people died. Now, which one was it? It was, well done. Steve Jobs died in 2011. And when he died, there was a lot of talk in the press and on the TV, in the newspapers, about a famous talk that he once made, in which he talked about connecting your dots to success. He talked about connecting your dots. Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. So he was kind of saying, we don't need a crystal ball to be able to be more successful because we cannot see into the future. Is that right? Can anybody see into the future? If so, I need my fortune telling. <laughs> Steve Jobs said, you can only connect your dots looking back. Think about that. You don't need to flip through any notes right now. Think about what this means to you. You cannot connect your dots looking forward. You can only connect your dots looking back. So when I heard this from Steve Jobs, I thought, you know what? I need to look back in my life and look back at my dots, if you like, or Another word for these dots could be significant changes in my life, right? Some significant turning points. And I think that's what Steve Jobs was referring to here. You've got to look back at all the significant things that happened to you in the past and then build on them if you are going to be successful in the future. Does that make sense? You've got to look back at the events or the things that happened to you that were successful and then build on them and do more of that to be successful in the future. So I have been connecting my dots and ta-da! I've actually brought them with me. <laughs> so would you come on a journey with me today? Would you like to come on a journey with me today from leaving school with no qualifications at 15 years old. Would you like to come on a journey with me today to see how my dots connect? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. What about you lot? Do you want to come on this journey with me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. I'm very glad about that. Um, so, dot number one is when I was 15 years old. I left school at 15 years old with no qualifications. The, pet, the teachers thought my parents were crazy. Why are you not letting her stay on at school to get more qualifications? And they said, she doesn't want to stay on at school. She wants to go to college. And I, was no, I hated geography and history. I was no good at all those academic subjects. So I left school. I then went to secretarial college for two years. By the end of those two years, I had more qualifications than anyone else in my class, and I got this prize, Student of the Year. <laughs> Normally I get a clap for that. <laughs> so do you see what happened? Within two short years, I found my niche. Yeah? Have you found your niche? Yes? I found my niche. So I'm going to come down here and ask 
some of you to be the guardians of my ducks. Darling, would you like to be guardian of duck number one? Thank you very much. So duck number one is me. Uh, leaving school with no qualifications and then finding my niche. Duck number two, I am now, what, 16 years old and I'm starting my first job. In Sheffield, a lot of you know that I'm from Sheffield, that's in the north of England. My first job was 14 pounds a week, times that by two, you can figure out. Um, and I was short on typist in the sales department. And I stayed at this same company for nine years. And I climbed my way up until I was secretary to the deputy managing director. There was only one man higher than the deputy managing director, and he was the? The managing director. <laughs> and his secretary was my best friend, Caroline. And I didn't want to be his secretary because I didn't like him. And because his secretary was my best friend, Caroline. Uh, my best friend, Caroline, has been an inspiration to me all my life. I went to England recently for three weeks, and guess who I stayed with? Caroline. My best friend, Caroline. So dot number two is my best friend, Caroline. Would you look after Caroline for me? So dot number three. Dot number three happened in 1981. Now, tell me, do you think it's important to get more qualifications? Is it important to get more pieces of paper? It is, isn't it? So I knew this, and I used to go back to night classes to get more qualifications. In 1981, I went to college two nights a week to study for my LCCI Private Secretary's Diploma. Has anybody got this qualification? Anybody done it? LCCI, Private Secretary <laughs> Certificate. Oh, I'm so happy. Well done. Well done, thank you. So I studied in 1981 for my LCCI Private Secretary's Diploma. It's the highest secretarial qualification in the world from the London Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Now, I, my boss paid for the course, by the way. Gosh, got to get the boss to pay, right? <laughs> so during that year, my teacher inspired me. And she also said, to all of us in the class, there is this competition going on in Sheffield right now, organized by the Junior Chamber of Commerce. And this competition was called Super Secretary 1981. And she said that we all had to enter. And everybody said, what do you think we said? Woohoo, let's enter. <laughs> Did we say that? No. <laughs> We all moaned and groaned and the teacher said, no, you must enter because it's going to be great practice for you. So we all entered the competition. There was shorthand tests, typing tests, interviews, telephone technique tests. There was a lot to do. And then the, the results were announced and the seven finalists were announced and we were all invited to the final at Romeo and Juliet's nightclub in Sheffield to hear the, the results. I was one of the seven finalists. I took my mom and my dad and my boss and my colleagues and my friends. They were all there in the audience. I can remember this like it was yesterday. Seven of us lined up on stage like a beauty competition. <laughs> it's a good job it wasn't. Um, and the third prize was announced, ladies and gentlemen, third prize winner in Super Secretary 1981, someone else. <laughs> Second prize in Super Secretary 1981, someone else. I need a drum roll now, please. First prize, Super Secretary 1981 is... Thank you. Who do you think was the most shocked person in the whole room? Not me, baby. <laughs> now, come on, who was it? It was. It was my boss. He said, you, super secretary? <laughs> but you know what? He was very happy because the next day, what was on the front page of the newspaper? Our photograph, me sitting on my boss's knee. <laughs> so... 
I have to give dot number three to whom? Who do you think is going to get this? Who is dot number three? Not my boss. It's that teacher. It's that teacher for pushing me and for making me get out of my comfort zone. Would you be my teacher? Thank you very much. I've got a band-aid that's just coming off my shoe there. <laughs> um, that teacher made us get out of our comfort zone because without that teacher, I don't think we would have entered that competition. Am I right? Yes. Absolutely. So, dot number four. I passed all my exams. I got my LCCI private secretary's diploma. So I went to my boss and I said, thank you for paying for me. I resign. <laughs> But he was okay because he knew that I'd got some aspirations. He knew that I'd got a dream and I'd been dreaming about this for a long time. I'd got a dream that I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher like that teacher was for me because she'd inspired me. So in 1982, I went to teacher training college for one year full time, a lot of really comprehensive study to be a teacher. Now at the end of that year, Remember, I'm from the north of England, very swaku. <laughs> I was looking through the newspaper one day and I saw this job. Teacher wanted to teach on LCCI, private secretary certificate and diploma courses. Wow. Just what I wanted. The next slide said, in Singapore. And I said to my friends, where's Singapore? <laughs> what did they say? In China. It's in China. <laughs> Some other friends said, no, 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 it's not in China, it's in Hong Kong. <laughs> so I looked on the map and what did I see? <laughs> Little tiny red dot. I did my research and I was invited to London. London is nowhere near Sheffield. It was three hours on a train in those days. I was interviewed by a lovely lady who speaks like the Queen of England. <laughs> Have you heard the Queen of England? The Queen of England, she speaks very, very posh, like this. She dare not open her mouth very wide. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure why. But um, this lovely, lovely lady speaks like the Queen. She interviewed me for the job. I don't know how I did it, but I got the job. She sent me to Singapore in August 1983. My Singaporean boss met me at the airport. She sat in front seat. Her colleague sat beside her. I sat in the back, talking all the way. <laughs> in my Sheffield accent, which is not quite like this. Nobody answered. And I sat there thinking, Singaporeans are very strange people. <laughs> I didn't find out until much later the reason why nobody answered me when I spoke. What was the reason? <laughs> they didn't understand a word I said. I found out much later that my boss, Rose, went to the telephone that night when she dropped me off at the house and she called a lady in England and said, we don't understand a word she says. We are sending her home on the first plane tomorrow. <laughs> that is a perfectly true story. This lovely lady in England said, oh darling, do give her a chance. I'm sure she'll realize that she needs to adjust her accent. Please give her a chance, darling. Well, I never quite got into speaking like the Queen. <laughs> but I did realize very quickly that you can't keep doing the same old thing in the same old way that you have done all your life if it's not working right now. True? You have to know and you have to recognize when you need to make changes. And I recognized it big time. So I learned to slow down my speech. And instead of saying butter and but and cup, I had to say butter <laughs> and butt and cup. Am I doing it right? <laughs> but you see, my face hurts. <laughs> I cannot say those words properly without a big smile on my face. <laughs> so I made
made some changes. And I was very grateful to one person who made that possible. And dot number four is my boss, Rose. So I think Rose is over here somewhere. Who wants to be Rose? Would you like to be Rose? Dot number four is Rose. So dot number five. After two years in Singapore, I went to live in Bahrain in the Middle East. Another learning curve. Another big learning curve, more changes to make. And I needed somebody to come out and give us some help at the college. So I called up that lovely lady in England who speaks like the Queen. She became a very big friend of mine. She became a mentor. She came out to Bahrain to give the college some advice and some mentorship. She was a dear, dear friend of mine. And I do believe I might have her. Oh, no, there's my super secretary trophy. <laughs> Just to prove it. Aha! Uh -huh. This is Pam Forrester. This is my dot, who I'm going to give away dot number five. She was the lady who interviewed me in 1981. She was my mentor for many years while I lived in Singapore, when I lived in Bahrain, uh, and since then back in Singapore. So dot number five is the most wonderful person Pam Forrester, for having that confidence in me. So dot number six. I went back to Singapore for another two year stint in 88 to 90. So it's my second time in Singapore. And during this time, I was working for the same boss. By the way, I taught her to say butter. <laughs> um, I was working for the same boss. And she said to me one day, Shirley, there are two representatives of Pearson Education in reception. They want to take me for lunch. Come with me. And I said, oh, yeah, boring la, business lunch. <laughs> you go la, you're very good at that sort of thing. She said, no, come with me. So I looked in reception out of a very small hole in the door, and I saw two very handsome men. <laughs> so I said, coming. <laughs> So I went for lunch with these two guys and with my boss. They wanted to know what books do we use for each subject in our college. So I was able to tell them for business studies we use this book as a student get it as a textbook. For um, typing we use this book. For shorthand we use this book. For administration we use this book. But for business English there was no book that was suitable. So I had to tell them we don't use a book. Students don't have a textbook for business English, for communication skills. So they said to me, we have already identified that there is a big need for a, a good book on communication skills. So they said to me, will you write us a book? I fell over and fainted. <laughs> I had never in my wildest dreams thought I could write a book or even wanted to write a book. But then they put that seed in my mind. And I thought to myself, if I don't do it, someone else will. True or not? If I didn't do it, someone else will do it. So I took that chance. I took three months unpaid leave. And I went to England. To, and I was working solidly. And I wrote that book. And that first book is now in its fourth edition. And I would never have got that opportunity without Dot number six, who is male? I have to find a man. Is there a man over here? I think I see a man. Would you be dot number six, darling? Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Friedman. Don't worry, you don't have to do anything yet, but you're all right. Yeah. Don't wanna, no pressure, no pressure. So as a result of that first book, the following year, the same publishers called me and said, Shirley, do you know this book called Model Business Letters by a guy called Gartside? And I said, yeah, I knew this book. Gartside had written that book in 75. He'd done the second edition in 78. He'd done the third edition in 80-something. And then the publishers were talking to me now in 1992, and they said, well, bad news. Mr. Gartside is dead. But we want you to revise this book. So what did I do? I fell over and fainted. <laughs> this 
guy was like a guru. He'd written the three, three editions. He'd done three revisions of this very, very successful book. And I thought, wow, how can I do a revision of this guy's book? But then I thought to myself, if I don't do it, absolutely, someone else will. So I revised that book. And, um, and that book is now in its seventh edition. Who's got a copy of that book, by the way? Put your hand up if you've got Model Business Letters, my book. I don't believe you. Yay! Good old Maxine, thank you. Um, that book is now in its seventh edition. It's translated and published in many different languages. I'm very proud of that book. It would never have happened without that man from Pearson Education, David Buckland, for giving me that chance and for helping me to go out of my comfort zone and to reach for something more. So we're on to dot number seven now. I had been meeting many, many people from Canada, and a lot of them said to me, you would really love Canada, Shirley. Why don't you go and live there? So I decided in 1991 that I was going to go and live in Canada. I had a dream that I was going to meet a Mountie. I was going to meet one of those fabulous, handsome Canadian mounties on a horse, and he was just going to fly, not fly, he was going to ride me into the sunset, and I was going to live in Canada and be happy ever after. <laughs> so, dot number seven is not the mountie, it's the one that got away. So, would you be the one that got away there? It never <laughs> happened. It never happened. But I still had a great time in Toronto, and I learned a lot. Dot number eight. Dot number eight, I went back to Sheffield. So we're now into the 90s now. I went back to Sheffield, and I lived in Sheffield with my mom during the 90s. And do you remember that lady? There she is again. She was the LCCI chief examiner for the London Chamber of Commerce Private Secretary's Diploma Examinations. That means she wrote the examinations and she had a team of examiners who marked the examinations. So I went back to England and she invited me to be an examiner. So I worked with her very closely as an examiner of those qualifications. A few years later, she was getting older and she was coming up to retirement. So she had to recommend someone to take on the role of chief examiner of the highest secretarial qualification. Who did she recommend? Can you imagine? Shirley from Sheffield with no qualifications when I left school, not academic whatsoever, she is now inviting me to be chief examiner for one of the highest secretarial qualifications. Did I say yes or no? Of course I said yes, because if I didn't do it, someone else would. So this lady is a very, very special lady. She's the only one I've given two dots to. Would you be Pam? Thank you very much. Dot number eight is Pam Forrester again. Dot number nine. Um, I kept coming back to Singapore during the 90s. I couldn't keep away from Singapore. And during one of those visits, I met up with one of those Pearson representatives again, the publisher's representatives again. And he told me a very interesting story. He said, Shirley, there is someone working at SIM, Singapore Institute of Management, who is teaching one day and two day business writing workshops. And she is recommending that everybody should buy your books. Wow. I said, wow, that's great. And he said, it's not great. You should be writing a book. You should, well, you have written a book. He said to me, you should be doing that two-day workshop. He said to me, you should be doing one day and two day workshops. Well, you see, at this time I'd been a teacher, but I'd never done one day workshops, two day workshops. And this guy is now telling me, you should do a workshop. So I, I'd never even thought about it before, but now he's put the idea in my mind. And I started thinking about it. And I thought to myself, if she can do it, so can I. So, can I. so I 
designed a one-day workshop on writing skills. That has become a two-day workshop on writing skills. That has become a lot more things, a lot more workshops, working with a lot more trainers. Do you see how one thing leads to another? It was just amazing. So dot number nine is the guy who said to me, you should be doing that workshop. There you are, darling. That's for you. Dot number nine is Leslie Lim from Pearson Education who gave me that idea that led to me writing even more books and writing even more workshops. So dot number 10. Don't worry, we're nearly at the end. <laughs> dot number 10, I came back to Singapore. Now dot number 10 is a very, very special dot. Dot number 10 is my mom. Because during the 90s, um, my mum's health started deteriorating. And I came back to Singapore in 2002. Um, but her health was deteriorating a lot. And I kept going back to visit her some more. Every year, I was going back two or three times more. Uh, and one time, it was very serious. And I knew she was reaching the end of her life. So I was in England for a, a long stretch with my mum. And she was expecting a visitor this day. And she said, give me my comb and my lipstick. So she puts, her, she puts the comb through her hair. She puts her lipstick on. She puts a bit of powder on her face. And this visitor arrived, a regular visitor, a friend of hers. And she said to my mum, Eileen, how can you stay so cheerful and you've always got a smile on your face when you're going through such inconvenience and suffering and she was in a lot of pain um, and you know what my mom said my mom said no one would want to come and see me if I was miserable and that was of the last photo we had taken. And it was a day when she was in so much pain. It was Christmas Day. And she was in so much pain. And her, her friend came to see her. And she took out a camera. And I said, please don't take a picture of my mom. She's in too much pain. And my mom said, pass me my lipstick. <laughs> and my mom put this smile on her face. And we had the best picture taken. Isn't that gorgeous? So, dot number 10 is the most special lady in my life. Who can that be? Who wants to be my mum? Would you like to be my mum, Nicole? Nicole, be my mum for a while. So, my mum is with us today. I know it. So, dot number 11. Um, a friend in 2003 took me to a meeting Remember, I'm a trainer now, I'm a speaker, I'm living in Singapore, I'm doing my training. And a friend of mine, another trainer called Ricky, he said, they've set up this association in Singapore called Asia Professional Speakers. I want you to come to a meeting with me tonight. So I said, oh, do I have to? Are you very paisley la? <laughs> so I went along to this meeting, and I can remember walking in my first meeting of the Asia Professional Speakers, APSS, and I was very daunted because I saw lots of very oh, big speakers, and um, I think, oh, gosh. So I remember following my friend around like a sheep. Don't leave me. <laughs> Don't leave me. Don't leave me. And I was very nervous. But I kept going back. Every month there were meetings. And I kept going back to these meetings. And the more I attended these meetings, the more I learned. The more I attended these meetings, the more friends I gained. The more I learned, the more I was able to share with other people. And the more I shared, the more I grew as a person. That was one of the best moves I've made in my journey, is joining that organization, Asia Professional Speakers. Along the years, uh, one of the presidents of the association said to me, Shirley, you would make a good president of this association. And I was like, what? It had never entered my head before. Never even dreamed about it. But I thought, 
And it's just, the seed was sown now, right? And I was thinking about it. What can I achieve if I really look to the future and think, what can I do? So a couple of years later, I went on the executive committee. And in 2011, I was voted in as president. So for one year, I spent a year as the president of Asia Professional Speakers Singapore, and I got to travel around the world as well. And since then, I'm, there's now what we call a Global Speakers Federation. The Global Speakers Federation is like the mothership. There are lots of speakers associations in lots of different countries, and we all belong to the Global Speakers Federation. So I've got to know a lot of global speakers. And just last July, the Global Speakers Federation asked me to join their executive committee. So I'm now on the Global Speakers Federation Executive Committee. Shirley from Sheffield. I have to say thank you to the guy who took me to my first meeting of Asia Professional Speakers Singapore. Because I don't think I would have gone along there if somebody hadn't pushed me. Would you like to be that person? That person is dot number 11. So dot number 12 happened a couple of months ago, actually. Dot number 12 happened a couple of months ago. I heard through one of our sponsors, actually, Executive Secretary Magazine, you've got one of their magazines in your goodie bag, the lady who is the publisher in London of Executive Secretary um, became the global ambassador for the international year of the secretary and admin assistant. It's called IOTSA, the International Year of the Secretary and Admin Assistant. This is a year that comes around every 10 years they have an International Year of the Secretary and Admin Assistant. Have you heard of it before today? Some of you yes, some of you no. This is the International Year. It's your year. This association in, in South Africa said we need um, the International Year of the Secretary and Admin Assistant to promote your role, to make it better known that you are an important person in the lives of business, in every organization. You are a very important person. Do you believe that? So this lovely lady in England said to me, there are going to be global ambassadors. By the end of this year, they hope to have an ambassador in every single country of the world. And she asked me to be Singapore's ambassador. So what do you, thank you. So again, I thought, oh my gosh, how do I do that? How do I be that? There you are, darling. Dot number 12 is the lady who invited me to be the, globe, the Singapore ambassador. And I'm now doing all I can to spread the word about IOTSA. And I think it's a really important year. So I've put these things on your table and I want you to write down your reason why you think it's important. Not now, you can do it during the break. The International Year of the Secretary is important because, why is it important? Let's spread that word. And we're gonna put all those things up there on the wall. So ladies, You've heard about my dots. Now, I connected my dots there, but that's not enough. It's not enough just to look back and, and think about all my dots. I had to think about the common, oh, there I am. This is my association, Asia Professional Speakers. That's the, uh, the slide for that one. I looked back at all my dots. And I came to the conclusion that there were two common elements connecting all my dots. Would you want to know what these common elements are? Do you think if I share with you the two common elements connecting my dots, do you think you'll be able to use these principles so that you can be more successful? Hello? Yes. Excellent. So I'm going to share with you. You don't need to flip your books. You can look at that later. The first common element at every single stage was I had to get out of my comfort zone. Because everything that makes life worthwhile is outside your comfort zone. If you look at this picture here, everything in there 
is mediocre, it's average, it's what if I can't, I'm depressed and I'm tired. But look what's outside the comfort zone. So much is possible when you step out of your comfort zone. But you know what? Have a look at this quote from Richard Branson, and I only saw this on Facebook the other day. If someone offers you an amazing opportunity and you're not sure you can do it, say yes. And then figure out how. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? This was only the other day, and I think the universe works in mysterious ways. Uh, Mariana, thank you for posting that. I know that post came from you. Figure out later how you can do it. So you've got to get out of your comfort zone. That means you've got to change. You've got to make some changes. When you try to make some changes, do you feel sometimes you're resisting it? Yes. Um, is that right? Yes. This place is your comfort zone. But when you get out of that comfort zone and you take control, how do you feel? You feel good and you make progress, and you have some successes, some small ones, some big ones, and then it improves your confidence. Can you relate to this? When you do something that you've been stretched for, and you've pushed yourself, and you've got out your comfort zone, it increases your self-confidence. And the more you do things out of your comfort zone, the more you will become a risk taker. I can really see that in the story of my life and in the story of my connecting my dots. And I hope you're going to remember this after today. And next time somebody gives you an opportunity, you're going to say, if I don't do it, the second common element, when I look back, in fact, what I'd like you to do now, if you have one of my dots, can you stand up, please, and hold it over your head? If you have one of my dots, can you stand up and hold it over your head? Not on your shoulder, above your headlamp. Look around the room. Look around the room. The second common element connecting all my dots. What do you see? Do you see dots? Do you see events in my life or do you see something else? Again? People. The second common element, when I look back at my successes, the second common element is that every single step of the way was made possible because of my relationship with people, because I built great connections. Great connections are very powerful, and I cannot stress enough that you need to start working more on building relationships. Don't just hide behind your computer. You need to start working more. I'm really glad that a lot of you are nodding, so you know this is true. You need to start working more at building really good relationships and working on developing them so that you can all become more successful. If you've got one of my dots, give yourselves a big clap. Thank you. Take a seat. When you start building relationships, you will start to see great progress being made. When you start building relationships, you will feel your confidence starting to rise. When you start building relationships, you will start to grow. Other people will also start to grow because of it, and they will be inspired because of it. So I really encourage you to take every opportunity you can to get out of your comfort zone and start building even better and closer relationships from today onwards. Because we've talked a lot today about connecting my dots. What you can do, and I've given you a space in the notes for you to do it, is look back at your dots. After today, look back at your significant turning points and see how you can build on them. Because you don't have to look into the future. What you need to do is look back at the past. And that way, you can build a more successful future. Does that sound like a good idea? <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a great, successful future. And the one thing I want you to remember from today is, if you don't do it, thank you all very much indeed. Have a great day today. Thank you.